Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, my name's Beth. I'm a researcher from the University of Edinburgh in the UK. And today I'm going to talk to you about microscopy for microbiologists. Obviously, this is a huge um, area, so I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but I'll cover a few select points that um, are relevant to my research and um, what I do, and I hope that you'll find it interesting. So, um, you know, you might be thinking, who is this uh, a random, oh, my slides aren't moving yet, who is this random person? So I thought I would just start off by introducing myself. So um, I did my undergraduate in medical microbiology at the University of Sheffield, which I think is a similar course to what uh, you're all doing now. So I think this was really my first um, exposure really to microscopy and the power of microscopy. And so, um, as was pretty standard for, for undergraduate labs, you would do uh, light microscopy and use um, phase contrast and bright field. So you'd be able to see cells in their native states, or you may add um, dyes to them to improve the contrast or give you some information like this gram stain here where you can see gram negative and gram positive bacteria. I then did my PhD in molecular microbiology at um, University of Nottingham. And here I was um, genetically modifying bacteria to express certain proteins that would fluoresce. And that would give us information about um, the cell localization in the membrane and enable us to look at um, turnover of cells in time and with different drugs. And so that was my first real, real experience of fluorescence microscopy. And then in the last five years now, I've been a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. And um, I look at researching optical imaging for infections and inflammation. And this is using in the body microscopy. So um, I'll touch on this in my talk as well today, just to give you an overview of the different types of microscopy and, um, and how they can be used. I'm really also trying to give you a bit of a flavor of um, what it's like to be a research microscopist as well, because I think it's, um, I'll just let someone else into the talk. I think it's quite important, uh, well, I think to see, you know, as well, different, different careers and different research that's going on, hopefully it might inspire some of you to, to continue with your studies, PhDs and work in the lab too. So, so the overview of my talk today will be um, why we need microscopy, a timeline of its history, you know, it's the, the fundamental um, building block of, uh, oh, sorry, just more people in. It's a fundamental building block of, uh, of our discipline. I'll talk to you a little bit about how microscopes work and some clinical applications um, in just light touch detail and then I'll go on to talk about um, the research that we're doing now using the microscope inside the body and also some frugal approaches to microscopy which is another avenue that I'm interested in. So um, printer. Great. So why do we need microscopy? I mean, it might sound quite obvious. So when you break down the word microscope, micro means small and scope means to look at. So we use the microscope to look at small things that we can't see with the human eye. And so you can see from this diagram here that, you know, we're, we're made of millions of different components and they've all got their own sizes and complexities and systems. And really we want to understand those to be able to build the bigger picture of health and disease. So really the human eye can't really tell us that much detail. We can just look at the surfaces of big things really and where we want to get into the nitty-gritty and understand processes and infection and how you know these systems are made up, we need to use microscopes to see small things. So there's two I guess key branches of microscopy. One is based on electron microscopy, um, which I won't talk about today, but there to see the really small things in really fine detail. And then also light microscopy, which will be the, the focus of my talk today. So in light microscopy, you can see things down to sort of micro, uh, micrometer resolution um, and above. And as you will know, bacteria are sort of a micron uh, in size, so we're really at the, the limit here for light microscopy, but luckily it works well. And we'll be looking at bright field microscopy today and also fluorescent microscopy. So 
uh, microscopes give us the uh, um, basically two main roles of a microscope. One, magnification, so we can make things look bigger. And here you can just see the uh, wire electron microscopy is so much more powerful in terms of uh, the, si the size of molecules that we're able to see. We have much higher magnification, but a thousand times magnification is good enough for bacteria. And then also the resolution of the microscope is really important to be able to get a clear picture of what it is we're trying to see. And so the resolution is, um, can be defined as the smallest distance between two points which can be separated. And I guess a, a practical way to think about this is if you're outside at night and you see a car coming towards you in the distance, you might just see one light source. But as it comes closer, you then are able to see that actually the car has got two different headlights and you're able to distinguish them uh, as being you know, distant to one another. And that's really what we mean by resolution. The better it is, the more you can separate things and the more information and detail you'll get. And so uses of the microscope really, to me, they function two main ways. One for research, really understanding the cell, what it's made of, how it interacts, how it works. And then also uh, clinical, you know, it's the bread and butter of clinical diagnosis the world over um, for diagnosing infections. And so really, um, these are the, the, two main, the two main uses of microscopes and really it covers the whole of microbiology. So microscopy has been with us for a long time. The first use of the word microscope was about 400 years ago, 1625, and actually, the fundamentals of microbiology have not, of, of microscopy have not changed in that time. It was 1665 when um, cells were first seen on the microscope and 1683 when bacteria were seen for the first time. So, you know, th these microscopes that were made uh, in the first instance, they had good magnification, they had good resolution. We were able to see these uh, individual microorganisms. And then, um, a couple of hundred years later, uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis was discovered for the first time by microscopy. And actually the techniques that we used to see mycobacteria then are more or less the same as they are now for uh, looking at sputum smear microscopy, which is one of the, the, the biggest uses of clinical micro, uh, micro, microscopy uh, to, to my mind. In 1911, so about 100 years ago, just over 100 years, we had our first fluorescence microscope. Um, and then, you know, in the, the late 70s, we had our first confocal laser scanning microscope. And I'll explain a little bit more the difference between the fluorescence microscope and the confocal microscope as we go on. And then really, since this time, we've seen massive advances in um, super resolution microscopy. So really getting that fine detail uh, through a number of different techniques and fluorescence lifetime. So exploiting fluorophores, which I'll talk to you about a bit later in uh, in different ways, not just looking at the intensity that's coming out of them. And then really where we are now is developing ways to do in situ fluorescence microscopy. So actually do microscopy inside the body. And then also um, moving to frugal microscopy as well. So one of the, um, the limiting factors really for fluorescence microscopy has been the cost. And actually it's meant that it's been prohibitive for um, much of the world. So really what we want to do is try and take these components and uh, make them more affordable. So. so how does a microscope work? Well, really, it's quite simple. This is just a standard light microscope that you should have in your, I expect you would have in your labs that you've used plenty of times already. And really, you'll be familiar that the components, they start off with a light source at the very base of the microscope, and this is just like a, a light bulb that you would have in your house. It sprays, uh, you know, the light comes out, it spreads, um, and then it goes through a condenser, which really just compacts the light down into a into a smaller, um, I guess, distribution, so that it goes up through your um, specimen and into the objective. And so. You have then your, uh, your sample on a slide on the stage. You're able to focus it so that you're able to get your objective, which essentially is your magnifying glass on the microscope. So you're able to see a nice clear picture. 
Um, and then the light travels up through the magnifying glass to the objectives to the detector or the, the eyepieces. And that's really all there is to it, a, a simple straightforward microscope. And when I said that my cross, these light microscopes have worked very well and they've been used for a long time, this here is a, the first photograph of bacteria that was ever taken um, at the 1877. And really this bright field image is quite similar to what you would get from, from a standard light microscope now these days. And as I said before, as well as uh, these kind of uh, plain images of the bacteria, we can also add special dyes to the bacteria to give us some information. So here is um, a gram stain. So the gram negatives are shown in pink and the gram positives are shown in purple. And so we're able to see color, color down these microscopes. And so they're really useful for straightforward simple processing and looking at samples, um, but they don't really allow us to get much functional information or um, specific components of the cells. Um, and really to get more information from the cells, we need to include fluorescence into our microscopy systems. And so fluorescence is um, basically where samples glow when you shine a light on them at a specific wavelength. So really you have your dye, and then you shine a light on it and depending on the characteristics of um, your, your uh, fluorophore, your, your dye, you shine the light on it and the electron um, will raise from the ground state up into the excited state. When it gets up into the excited state, um, it's not very stable, it doesn't stay there for long so it wants to come back down to the ground state. As it comes down to the ground state, it loses energy and it emits it as a photon of light, and that's what we want to detect. So, depending on your molecule, different wavelengths will excite it, and different wavelengths will come out of the from the fluorescence. So, um, so we have a whole region in the visible spectrum of light, um, and we can exploit any of these regions for fluorescence. And so just to give you an idea of what the spectrum looks like for the, the molecule that's in my example here, where we excite it with blue light, this molecule, um, you'll see, uh, has a peak excitation here of about 450 nanometers, which means this is going to be the most efficient uh, wavelength to shine onto our fluorophore um, here. So if we shine on 450 nanometers, that will excite things um, the most productively and then it emits light within this spectrum here in the green so when you the light comes out it shifts to the right so then we collect the light um, anywhere between 500 and 600 but the most uh, signal and brightest signal that you want to collect is going to be here again at about 550 nanometers and really it's the collection of this light that gives us our fluorescent signal um, I know that might sound a bit complicated and I hope that you're still with me but basically the special dyes you shine light on them at specific wavelengths that are characteristic for that dye and then they emit light and you capture that light. So the advantages of using fluorescence over just standard uh, bright field microscopy is that it's much easier to detect your samples you're looking for something glowing on a dark background um, and so for that reason we have improved sensitivity over dyes as well so you can the um, smaller or less common features and also it means that we can um, label and look at specific molecules or features of interest um, which might be proteins um, that are expressed in the cell or composition of the cell wall. Um, disadvantages of fluorescence are that we, we do suffer from photo bleaching and what I mean by photo bleaching is that this pathway here um, if you, if you add too much excitation light, eventually this circuit will stop and these uh, electrons won't be able to raise from the ground state and so we get no more fluorescence coming out. Um, this can be recovered by giving the molecules a bit of a rest and we can come back in or it might be permanent destruction of the fluorophore. So it means that we have to be quite quick when we um, do our imaging and um, we have to be careful about laser power. And also the microscopes compared to the standard uh, light microscope that I showed in the previous slide are more sophisticated and more expensive. So 
there's a range of different fluorescent stains we can use for fluorescence microscopy. Um, I guess some of the most common are biological fluorescent stains. And these are molecules that will either bind to, um, bind to uh, things of interest within the cell either inherently. So there's a few dyes that, for example, will, stain, will bind to DNA on their own, and there's other dyes that will bind to lipids, so the membrane on their own. Or we might need to have a targeting group attached to the fluorophore. So the targeting group might um, bind to a specific receptor, for example. So then we can say, oh, that, um, that receptor is um, active and present on that cell. Um, we have immunofluorescence, which uses fluorescently labeled antibodies, again, for looking at specific proteins or targets in the cell. And then fluorescent proteins, which actually really have revolutionized um, fluorescence imaging and molecular biology. Um, fluorescent proteins are genetically modified uh, proteins which fluoresce. They can be incorporated um, through cloning, etc., into cells. And then when the protein is expressed, it will be expressed and tagged at the same time. So we can look at movement of proteins within cells, how different proteins interact with one another. And um, really these fluorescent proteins here, you can see in this image, they cover the whole spectrum of visible light. So really we can get fluorescence all the way across the spectrum. And if we pick fluorophores or fluorescent proteins that are spectrally distinct from one another, we can build them in together and multiplex them together. And really this pioneering work was done by um, Roger Chen, who uh, was a Nobel laureate. Uh, he, he got his Nobel Prize for, for really for work on GFP, which is the underpinning, um, un the, the underpinning, I guess, discovery and uh, research area that's led to this whole field of um, fluorescently labeled proteins. And I like to show this image. This image is um, an agar plate that's been streaked with bacteria, how, how you usually would in the lab. But the bacteria were all expressing different fluorescent proteins that have been made in his lab. So when you shine the light on them, you know, you get this nice tropical picture, whereas without the fluorescence, they would just look like regular bacteria on a plate. So I think that that's pretty cool and hopefully um, gets the point across. Um, but that's the last I'll say for fluorescent proteins today because they're very useful for research and understanding the cell, um, but really the rest of my talk now is going to be about um, how we can move to translation in the clinic and how we can um, use fluorescence as a, a useful diagnostic tool. Sorry, just checking on this last one again. Okay, so I've explained to you how a uh, um, light microscope works. So a fluorescent microscope is not all that different. You still have your um, white light source that you shine into the system, but rather than having the whole light spectrum go through your sample, you have a filter which gets rid of all the wavelengths that you're not interested in for your specific fluorophore. So it only lets in the blue light, like we saw in our example earlier, blue light excites the molecule. So the blue light comes in, touches your specimen, and then because of that excitation and the shift to the right, we then get green light coming up and off the sample. That green light then passes through, um, through your emission filter so that you know you're only collecting the light that's come from that specific molecule that you're interested in, and then you detect it either with the eyepieces or with a camera. So really it's quite, quite a simple, straightforward setup. You still have your objective in there as well. It's not shown in this diagram, um, but, that, but that's it really. Um, and the kind of image you would get from a fluorescence microscope, you, you can see here. And I hope you can appreciate that it's very easy to see the green blobs. The green blobs are the bacteria. Um, they stand out really easily against the background compared to the bright field microscope. But actually, the resolution is still quite poor. They look like blobs. They've got fuzzy edges because we don't have good um, resolution, which is what I explained at the start about the, differenti uh, the differentiation between two different points. So, to improve the resolution, um, we can do something called confocal microscopy. And confocal microscopy, again, is based on fluorescence microscopy, but it's um, put in a way that we're able to filter out the out of focus light. And we use pinholes to do this. So, we really direct the light and only collect the light coming from our sample focal plane, not the light that's above or below it. Um, 
Someone has got their microphone on, I think. Can you just check your muted? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so we filter out the out of focus light. And really what that means is that we're able to get a much sharper image, much higher resolution, as I hope you can appreciate here. So rather than seeing the bacteria just as blobs on the, on the field of view on the screen, we're able here to really see defined, almost like donut rings. Um, these are staph aureus that have been labeled with the same dye that was on the, the previous bright field image here. Um, but what we're able to see is membrane and hopefully um, if your screens are big enough you can see that you can even see the bacteria dividing because that's how sharp um, how sharp the images are so really you can see that we're able to look at cellular areas the membrane versus the cytoplasm for example um, with, with this and you would be able to see where the bacteria were internalized inside immune cells or or, or not except for examples of confocal microscopy. So really, how do we use this microscopy in the clinic? How does it help us make diagnostic decisions? Well, I already mentioned the gram stain. I think the gram stain is the, the cornerstone of um, microsc uh, microscopy diagnostics. It was developed in 1884. So this is a technique that's been around for a long, long time. And actually, really, it hasn't changed since. So you would take your clinical specimen, uh, whether that be from, say, blood or a swab or um, a corneal scrape, and that's an example I will go into in a little bit more detail in a minute. You take your sample, you smear it onto a slide, you then heat fix the slide so that the bacteria then are dead and stuck very firmly to the, to the slide. You then add um, a number of dyes in a certain sequence. So first of all, you'd start off with um, crystal violet, which is your purple dye. And then you would add iodine, um, which this stains all the bacteria on the slide, but then you do a decolorization step with alcohol, and that essentially washes the dye out of gram negatives. The cell walls are a bit more leaky than gram positives, so it washes the cells out. Um, and then we add a counter dye to this, which is uh, saffron, which is our pink dye. And so then when we take our completed um, microscopy slide and, and look at it, we're able to then tell the difference between gram positives and gram negatives. And this is really fundamental because a lot of antibiotics, well, first of all, it will tell you whether you've got bacteria there or not, and then whether or not those are gram positive or gram negative. And that's really important for then um, the clinical decision of which antibiotics to give because gram positives and gram negatives generally require different types of antibiotics. And these tests are very rapid. You can get all this done from your clinical um, sampling to result in about half an hour. Um, so one of the, the clinical applications that's very close to my heart is um, for the diagnosis of corneal ulcer. Um, and so the reason why this is so useful and important in this kind of uh, infection, it, it's an infection that affects many people across Southeast Asia, Africa, um, so low resource settings really, um, where people struggle to access healthcare um, and there's, there's a high incidence and it's an acute condition. 60% uh, of cases lead to permanent uh, vision loss of some description and actually 50% of these ulcers are bacterial and 50% are fungal. So it's really important to understand what the causative organism is because within days, you can lose your vision. There's no time to wait for um, bacterial cultures, for example, to grow. So the gram stain is the perfect tool for diagnosing these patients. So apologies if you're squeamish, but this here is an image of a corneal ulcer. And so these patients, they'll have a scrape taken from the ulcer and then it's smeared directly onto a slide. The slide will undergo the staining that I've just described to you. And these are the kind of images that you get uh, from this um, procedure. So you can see here clearly on the gram stain um, that we have gram positive bacteria on the bottom, we have gram negative bacteria here, and here we have fungal filament. So this diagnostic tool really enables us to distinguish and diagnose the patient very, very quickly. Um, and these slides have been taken by uh, my friend and colleague Ramesh, who he works at Aravind Eye Care System in India. Um, and the reason that I just mentioned this is because the only hospital that Aravind um, managed outside of uh, India is in uh, your city. And it was just a nice link that, um, that, that I thought was, 
thought was interesting. Um, and so this is a, a useful clinical application for, for gram stains. They, they see thousands of patients per year and do this thousands of times per year. Um, and it really is the, the bread and butter for this infection. The other clinical application that I wanted to mention to you was for TB. I said um, at the start of my talk that you know TB was first discovered by looking down a microscope and actually sputum smear microscopy again is the cornerstone for TB diagnosis. Between a third and 50 percent of the world is infected with TB at any one time and it will go on to kill about one and a half million people per year which is terrible to be perfectly honest and actually Mutant smear microscopy remains the primary method for TB diagnosis in resource poor settings, you know, out in the community um, where, where the prevalence is high. And so traditionally, you would do a, a dye staining for these samples. So the patient gives their sputum, it goes through a decontamination process where um, non mycobacteria bacteria are killed from the sample. So if you've got say um, Staph aureus or E. coli in there, that they're killed from the sample. It then goes through a bit of a liquidation step so that you're able to then smear out the sample onto a slide. It's fixed similarly to the, the gram stain sample and then it has uh, zeal Nielsen dyes added to it. And you can see the mycobacteria uh, stained in purple and there's a lot of um, off-target cellular debris here in these samples. And so in areas like here, where you have um, few, uh, few debris and big clumps of bacteria, they're very easy to see. Whereas over here, where you have a few and they're overlaid with the, um, with the, the debris, they're very difficult to see. And so actually fluorescence microscopy has um, become very important and has been very helpful for clinical diagnosis of TB. It's the recommended diagnostic um, Tool for diagnosing smutum spheres from TB patients. It has higher sensitivity, it's quicker, and um, the, the healthcare worker that's imaging can um, turn around the samples a lot quicker. Um, but really, the cost of the fluorescent microscope is really prohibitive. And I read that in 2014, only 7% of labs actually could do fluorescence microscopy. But I think you can appreciate here the benefit that it really would have because. Even where we have just a few sample, few um, bacteria in the sample, they stand out very, very clearly. We get rid of all of that background fluorescence. So, I think, you know, it's it's a shame that these devices are too expensive. Which is why, um, at the end of the talk, I'll just briefly mention uh, frugal uh, microscopes and actually have the impact that they could have. But just, you know, think how think how much is being missed. Um, in terms of TB diagnosis, just because the, the kit is too expensive, I think it's a real travesty to be honest. Um, but that's as much as I'll say on that for now. I, I could go on about that all day, but I won't. Um, so that sort of wraps up the first part of my presentation on um, traditional benchtop microscopes, I suppose. Um, and hopes, hopefully, it's given you a good overview. Um, what I want to talk to you next, talk about next, is. Um, is about moving the microscope into the person. I mean, hopefully, hopefully the stuff I've gone through so far has not been too alien to you. You've kind of, you're more accustomed to it. You've come across most of it before. What I'm going to talk to you about next, really, to my mind, is is part of the future of microscopy. Um, and so hopefully it'll be something a bit new and a bit different for you. And I would like to talk about my research. So um, away we go. So. Everything that we've discussed so far has been taking samples away from the patient, fixing them, killing the samples, and then looking at them on the microscope. Um, and whilst that's very useful, obviously, I mean, I've described how it's got its place. What it really misses is the complex interactions of the bacteria and the host. We're not able to see, is the immune response responding? Is the bacteria just colonizing? Is it actually causing a, a pathological um, infection? Uh, we know that bacterial phenotypes change when they're taken outside of the body. Bacteria start to respond to antibiotics differently outside of the body compared to inside of the body. Uh, we're not able to see dynamic disease processes as they happen, and they also really are dependent on the sample quality and the processing step. So really what we want to know is what if we can see bacteria in seconds inside the body so we get a much more rounded, complete picture of 
where they are, how they're spatially located, what are the cells and tissues are around them. Um, you know, how is the host responding? Is, is it adequate? Do we need to treat or should we let the host response have more time? How can we help the host? Um, see if the treatment is working or not. And so really we're at the beginning of this journey. Like I said, I think this is a platform that's gonna expand in, in, in the uh, coming years. So really this is, we're at the beginning of the journey, but I would like to, to bring, you, bring you with me on it. So uh, the, the clinical application that we're developing this for at the minute is for um, patients in intensive care with lung failure. And obviously that's quite topical at the minute with um, the global COVID crisis that's going on at the minute. But even without that, lung failure is the leading cause of ICU admissions worldwide. These are the sickest patients in the hospital. And once they go into ICU, they get put onto ventilators and that, um, these patients then suffer from a rapid um, decline in their, their lung function. And so the patient will have an x-ray taken, like is shown here, and actually an x-ray is very non-specific to the clinician. An x-ray that looks like this could be any one of these conditions. And as you can imagine, they each have different treatment strategies. Um, and so it's really important to get, get the diagnosis right. And so the patient, uh, the clinician at this point, really has to treat for everything and anything because they just don't know what they're dealing with. And as well as the x-rays, um, other diagnostic parameters for these patients, CT scans, well, you can't move the patient, you can't go and do a CT scan. You can do a bronchoscopy procedure, and that's where you insert a camera down into the lungs and you have a look, but the problem with that is that the, the camera gets wedged quite uh, far up in the lungs because um, it's too big, and really it only gives you sort of a camera view like your mobile phone camera would be able to do. You can't really see uh, anything small or the, the fluorescence, for example. Lavage is where you put fluid into the lungs and then suck it back out. And then you do bacterial culture, you might do a gram stain, and you try and see what bacteria you might be bringing out with that fluid. But blood biomarkers are very non-specific and biopsy is not safe to do in these patient cohorts. So all of these techniques, they take time, they have force of specificity, and they're also invasive to the patients. And importantly, they contribute to antibiotic overuse, uh, which leads to uh, antibiotic resistance, which we all know is a, a major challenge facing all of us worldwide. And none, none of these, as I've said, account for dynamic disease processes. They're all taken out samples that are uh, looked at individually, and they're, they're fixed a snapshot of time. So we know these patients have, um, although their x-rays might look the same, at the molecular level, the pathologies are all very different. And so what we want to do is bring the microscope inside the patient to be able to see what is happening to these patients in real time. And so the, the, the technique, that, and, and this will allow us to understand uh, the processes that are happening in the lung. And the, the technique that we use for this is called optical molecular imaging. And it's basically bringing the microscope inside the human. So this is what the system uh, looks like. So here essentially is all the, the complexity of the, the microscope inside this box. And then instead of having eyepieces directly attached to it, uh, you, I suppose you have a fiber and this fibre we put down inside the lungs and the fibre becomes our eyepieces. The fibre is connected to a camera. So we're able to, to look at what's happening inside based on the fibre. And that's our objective and our focal, uh, yeah, our focusing, I guess. And then we, we collect the videos. And so these patients have a bronchoscope inserted into the lungs. They then have a fibre put down inside, which passes out to the alveolar space, which is the region of interest. Um, so here you can see a video, the bronchoscope is wedged. We push the fibre out and through into the lungs and we're able to do fluorescence imaging. So here you can see, this is inside the human lung here. And luckily for us, the human lung is very autofluorescent. So we're able to see strands of elastin and collagen, which are autofluorescing. And then the dark bits in between are the alveolar sacs, so the, the airspace where the gas exchange happens and really where we want to be seeing what the pathology is. But, um, but 
this again only gives us structural information it's not really giving us any dynamic information at all and so what we want to do is spray in our contrast agents so our fluorophores that um, i described earlier um, or our dyes and actually spray them directly in so then this becomes our sample like you would have on the microscope stage and so we spray in these compounds and we're able to get a, a picture of what's what's happening this becomes our microscope uh, slide essentially so within um, our group and others as well are developing a range of different um, fluorophores and probes and dyes that are able to label lots of different things that would be interesting to look at in real time in disease so some of the the lead compounds um, will tell you about neutrophil activation so what is the immune system doing Fibroproliferation, so that's what scarring is happening, what tissue destruction is happening. Um, and then also labels for bacteria, so whether these are for gram positive bacteria, gram negative bacteria, for TB or for fungi, they're all very important to understand um, what's actually going to be happening there in real time. So, talking specifically about bacteria probes, um, I'll talk. So bacteria probes, there's a number of different approaches that have been undertaken to develop these probes. Some of the most promising are based around antibiotics or antimicrobial peptides, which will be specific to the gram status of the bacteria, for example. So you have your binding domain, which is based on your antibiotic. You have a linker, which is used to attach the fluorophore onto the, onto the imaging agent, onto the probe. And so really when we're developing these, we need to consider um, the signal to noise of the fluorophores. You know, you need them to be bright when they are on their targets. You know, in situ inside the body, you're not able to do lots of wash steps or um, complex processing. So actually there's a group of fluorophores that will switch from off to on when they meet their targets, which means that we don't have to worry about wash stepping. They've got really high signal to noise. We need to make sure that they have high specificity. We can't have um, everything lighting up like a Christmas tree inside there. We need to know that what's labeled is what we think it is. Um, and of course, because these are now going into patients, we need to be really careful about the toxicity and the toxicity and the solubility of the probes. Um, so these are all considerations. And um, this is one of the probes that's been developed in our lab. It's for gram negative um, bacteria and it's activatable, which means that when it's not uh, binding to its target, we have no fluorescence. And when it binds to its target, we have high fluorescence. So you can see here, our probe is labeling E. coli, Pseudomonas and Klebsiella uh, with high signal, no wash steps involved, and it's not labeling our gram positive. And so this has um, undergone a lot of iterative testing and design, and actually it's taken hundreds of molecules to get to a point where we have one that we think is good and will work in vivo. So we, um, we do a lot of benchtop confocal microscopy like I showed you here. Um, and then we move up to more complex models. And I just wanted to show you this as an example of what we get up to in the lab. And it's not always just small things in Petri dishes, you know, we can bring in different, um, different models and we really mimic the clinical environment. And so we have uh, sheep lungs that we're able to bring in and ventilate infect and then we can spray in our probes and test our imaging technologies too and so this is really what some of the data looks like so this is within our sheep lungs using our um, in situ microscope and so our gram positive uh, samples here have no um, increase in green fluorescence from the fluorescent probe but our gram negative um, sections of lung all have increase in signal and when we quantify this we have high sensitivity and specificity um, which means that it's working well we're able to detect it and you can see that you know the scale bar here is 50 micrometers so we really are looking at the, the microscopic level here with within the tissue um, we're able to increase the complexity of our samples so we're fortunate enough to get not fit for transplant human lungs and diseased tissue so these are um, videos I'm going to show you from lungs that have been taken out from a cystic fibrosis patient that underwent transplant. The first video will have none of our fluorescent probe and the second video will have our fluorescent probe added. And you can see hopefully very clearly that in the bottom image we have lots of twinkling and that twinkling there is you see in the bacteria in real time. So you're able to see 
where they are in the tissue, how many are there without dilution factors, and really um, it gives you a good indication in real time that we're seeing the, the bacteria um, are present and it gives us a diagnostic indication that this patient has gram-negative bacteria, which is what you would expect from a cystic fibrosis lung. Um, we then also moved on to first in human clinical studies. And so these were um, conducted in a range of patients, but including patients in intensive care who would all have lung deterioration, x-rays that are nonspecific. The clinician suspects um, pneumonia in all these patient cases. But actually, when we go in with our uh, in situ microscope and a spray in our um, probe that is able to detect gram negative bacteria, you can see that actually the pathologies of all of these lungs are very different. The first is edema, which means that it's full of fluid and bubbles. The second one is an alveolar collapse, so we're not getting good uh, expansion and contraction of the lungs and no um, gas exchange. And the bottom one, you can see we've got twinkling bacteria in there, so the bottom one is a true pneumonia case. And so this really means that within seconds of putting the, the microscope inside the patient, we can say this patient here has got a gram-negative infection. And you can imagine sampling this is tricky, you have to then take it to the lab, do all the conventional stains, it takes a lot longer to get, to get the same, um, same answer. And really when we quantify the range of patients in this clinical study, um, we're able to see that our patients that we thought were gram negatives based on our imaging by classical microbiology um, and pathology, we, we had good um, matching and alignment, which is really encouraging. And actually we're now scaling up the, the clinical studies uh, with this probe too. Um, so the, really I think, hopefully I've given you a glimpse here into what some of the future of microscopy can be actually inside the patient. This um, microscopy method, it's immediate, it's done at the patient's bedside, it's safe, seems to be accurate in the, the conditions that we're doing as to the decision making. But the real issue, again, like all I've said for all these fluorescent um, endeavours, is the cost. These uh, machines cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's really an issue and that's something that we're looking to address. And I'll just I'll mention that briefly on the next slide. But really, um, you know, technologies, they start off expensive and then you work out how to make them cheaper. And that's really what we're doing now. But we really think that this approach to microscopy will help us to stratify patients, understand the effects of drugs that are happening with the bacteria in real time, enable us to understand more about um, innate uh, inflammatory responses and also how we're responding to drugs. But just, um, I won't take up much more of your time, but just for the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to mention frugal microscopy because this is something I think is amazing and uh, something that we're having a lot of fun with in the lab at the minute and that's because the component parts that are fundamental to doing fluorescent microscopy really actually when you, it comes down to it they can be um, substituted and very cheap versions can be added so LEDs your, your light source for your fluorescent microscope you can buy these for less than a dollar each now and they're getting better all the time so these kind of things can be substituted in. Filters, you don't need, necessarily need fancy filters. You can get very cheap ones for, again, less than a dollar. And photodiodes are um, a bit of equipment that you can use to actually capture the, the photons that are coming out of the fluorophores, not necessarily with imaging, but they will tell you, yes, there is signal, no, there's not signal. And so really, if you can package these together and then drive them with something like a Raspberry Pi, which is uh, I'm sure you're probably familiar with, there's a mini computer um, that's actually very affordable, easily programmable. Um, you can actually build these into um, microscope systems. And this is something that a lot of the community are looking towards developing at the minute. And I think they're really cool. And just some of the, the systems that are um, the most promising, I think, and the most interesting, uh, I'm just going to highlight them very quickly now. So one of them, this first one is called the water scope. And the water scope has developed to um, basically to look at water samples for bacterial contamination um, in low resource settings. And what they've done is they've made their, um, this is a 3D printed microscope, and they've made their design for this um, open source. So we downloaded the open source software from their website and 3D printed it in the lab. 
and we added um, a Raspberry Pi lens and a cam and the Raspberry Pi I think is under there for um, for driving the camera and collecting the images. We have our cheap LED up here at the top. These are used for your focal planes. So really it has everything you need for a very simple microscope. And actually with this at the minute, we're able to look at cells and we're looking at how we can make this into a fluorescent microscope and, and others are as well. Um, and I think that this is something that could actually be really cool. You can just print this um, wherever you are <coughs> for a few dollars really. Um, one of the other most popular frugal microscopes at the minute is called the fold scope. And this basically is a paper microscope with just a small lens. You can buy this for a few dollars. And this at the minute will give you a magnification of 140 times with two micron resolution, I think, which is not enough at the minute for bacterial detection, but you can see where they're going with this and people are modifying and hacking these uh, all the time to improve them. Um, this is uh, probably quite important as well. Smartphones are ubiquitous everywhere and the cameras on them are actually really good. But one of the issues is that um, we're not able to detect fluorescence with them as they are because we don't have the filters like I explained earlier. But actually, um, one of the students in our lab, she developed um, built, uh, sort of lenses that can go onto the smartphone so you get bigger uh, magnification of your sample, but they also have the um emission filters um actually within that lens so that means that you're able to actually look at fluorescent bacterial samples with your smartphone and those lenses they cost a couple of pennies to make and so we're at the very start of this now but that's something that's very exciting if you can just turn your smartphone into a fluorescent microscope that you can just look at your bacterial samples with i think it's something really cool and lots of people are working towards this too um, I've not referenced this exhaustively. And then, you know, I mentioned that the, the in situ microscope for looking inside the lungs or any other area in the body was very expensive. So other people are working on trying to make this much more affordable rather than using lasers, they're using LEDs, which of course brings the price down a lot and improving the capability of these. So, um, I've put a few references on here so you can look at that more in your own time. I just wanted to make you aware that these things are happening and I think they're amazing. We're going to see a lot more coming from this area in the, in the next few years too. So just to summarise, um, you know, microscopes are really fundamental to microbiology. They're crucial for both developing our fundamental understanding of bacteria, basic research and how we can manipulate them, but also for clinical diagnosis of infections. We really need to strike a harmony between the technological, uh, technological development and also the chemical development of the devices and the probe, and really the best ways to sample the, the bacteria or prepare the bacteria to. Uh, in the future, I think in situ microscopy is going to become much bigger and it's going to be really important for studying host pathogen interactions and actually could be a new way to look at the microbiome. Um, rather than take samples out and process them, can we do microbiome research inside the body too? Um, we do need better fluorescent labels for this, but I think they're coming. Um, and I really think that frugal innovations are really gonna be a, a leveler and give us a lot more um, ubiquitous access to diagnostics and research platforms uh, globally, which I think really needs to, to happen sooner rather than later. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for listening um, and any questions you have or feedback I'd be very happy to receive. Uh, thank you. Hello Dr. Beth. Hi. Okay, um, when you talked about um, people suffering confocal ulcer in India, were you referring to the use of light microscopy or fluorescence? So the so for the corneal ulcer is um, just general light microscopy with the gram stain. So the gram stain is not fluorescent, it's just the coloured dyes. Okay. Hmm. Does anyone else have anything? Hi, uh, Dr. Beth, these in situ microscopes, do they require any form of staining? So it really depends on what you're trying to look at. So when we put the, 
the in situ microscope in, the lung auto the lung tissue auto fluoresces. So for that, we don't need any um, fluorophores or any stains. But for looking at the bacteria, because they don't auto fluoresce on their own, we have to add some sort of stain or contrast agent in for those. All right. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Anything that wasn't covered that you were hoping would be covered? <clears throat> no? Okay. Well, if you think of anything, please just feel free to get in touch and I'll um, share the, the slides and the, 